Hello, my name is Charles. I'm one of the anaesthetics registrars, and I'll be talking to you today about the ABCDE assessment of a critically ill patient. Now, it's important to note that this will not be a comprehensive evaluation of how to do such an assessment, but it will give you the basic tools and the structure required to approach somebody who's a bit more unwell than your standard patient on a ward setting. If somebody's critically ill, the usual process of history, examination and investigation isn't appropriate because time just won't allow it. So you need to have a structure in mind of how you can approach a patient who's critically ill that means you catch the most serious life-threatening pathologies first and deal with them before moving on. And that's what we'll talk about today. At each step you'll assess the patient and then you'll intervene if you find something that's abnormal and then go back and reassess to make an evaluation of whether the thing that you've done has made a difference. The first thing you look at is always the airway, and that's because loss of airway will lead to fatality before anything else will. So the number one question is whether or not the airway is open. So if the airway is partly obstructed, you'll have noise, but there'll be added sound like gurgling or strider, perhaps some wheezing, perhaps some whistling. Or you may be able to actually visibly see that there's an obstruction such as blood or vomit or debris or a foreign body. If the airway is totally obstructed, there'll be no noise whatsoever. So the number one thing to notice is when there's absolutely no sound from an airway. Good way to think of it is that a noisy airway is at least a partly open airway. If the airway is obstructed, either completely or partly, then it's essential that you intervene immediately. You need to be calling for help, but don't let getting help delay your intervention. Simple life-saving measures are a triple manoeuvre. This consists of a head tilt, a chin lift and a jaw thrust. And this will move the tongue off the posterior wall of the pharynx and will often alleviate the problem with the obstruction. If obstruction is due to a foreign body or due to blood or debris, then suction is the way to remove that, and this is available in most clinical areas. It may be that these manoeuvres aren't enough and that you need to consider the use of airway adjuncts, such as a nasopharyngeal airway, or in a very obtunded patient, a Goodell or oropharyngeal airway. The particulars of this will be covered elsewhere, so don't worry about them too much, but know that they're one of the first things you do if you're concerned about a patient's airway. Once you're reassessing, particular warning signs would be if the obstruction hadn't been alleviated by the use of an adjunct, and we're really worried about things like grunting or stridor. An obstructed airway will often produce a paradoxical respiratory movement called seesaw respiration. If you see this, the airway is definitely obstructed. You definitely need to try a triple manoeuvre. You definitely need to apply high flow oxygen, 15 litres per minute via a non-rebreathe mask, and you definitely need senior help. Thankfully, this is rare, but it does happen. The next thing you assess is breathing, and there are some key questions. First, what is the rate? And that may be too fast or it may be too slow. What is the effort? And that may be increased or reduced. So if you've got increased effort, that means there is a reason that respiration isn't effective despite mechanically taking place. If it's reduced, then there's no drive to trigger a breath and the patient is most likely under the influence of medication or has a decreased conscious level. If breathing is noisy, then you have to go back and consider whether your airway is patent or if it may be partly obstructed. When you're looking at the effort, look for the use of accessory muscles such as in the shoulders or in the abdomen to achieve movement of the chest. If accessory muscles are being used, then this suggests that it's hard work for the patient to breathe. Once you've assessed the rhythm and the rate, you need to assess whether the effort that the patient is going to is actually effective. This can be done by looking at the patient, looking for signs of cyanosis, and also by applying an oxygen saturations probe, which will give you a numerical readout of how saturated the haemoglobin in their blood is with oxygen. If that's below 94, there's probably a problem, although some patients with chronic respiratory disease do run a little bit hypoxic. Interventions, if you're not happy with breathing, start with simple things, high flow oxygen, 15 litres a minute, non-rebreathe mask. If the patient's making no respiratory effort at all, then this is a respiratory arrest and you would commence bag mask ventilation and call for assistance on 2222. If you're happy with the airway and you're happy with the breathing, then you'd move on to circulation. And you would assess this by looking for signs of shock. So somebody with very poor circulation who would be pale and clammy. You would feel the pulse and you would want to know about its rate, whether it's too fast or too slow. You'd want to know about its rhythm, whether it's regular or irregular. And you'd want to know something about its character, that is its strength. Is it thready? Is it bounding? Or does it feel about normal? You can look at the capillary refill time, and this can be done either in the fingertip or some other periphery, or it can be done over the sternum in a small child. This involves 
occluding the capillaries for five seconds, counting them out slowly, and releasing the pressure and seeing how long it takes for the skin to return to its usual colour. If it's less than two, then the circulation is good. More than that, and you're into the territory of making an assessment of how profound the shock is. Worrying signs in circulation would be if somebody was profoundly shut down peripherally, so cold hands and a very prolonged capillary refill time. If you have a slow pulse less than 40 or a quick one over 110. If you have a low systolic blood pressure of less than 90 or a high one above 210. Or if somebody has a newly irregular heart rate, which you could pick up either by the pulse or by the ECG. Interventions would be to get IV access immediately. Consider a fluid bolus if you think that hypovolemia or distributive shock might be the problem. And of course, if you didn't feel a pulse in the first instance, the first thing you would do is commence CPR. If you're happy with the patient's airway and breathing and circulation, then you'd move on to disability. And at this point, you're looking for neurological impairment. The most simple thing that you would do is assess conscious level with an AVPU scale. Alert, responding to voice, responding to pain, or unresponsive. GCS is a more comprehensive way of assessing somebody's neurological status, but it takes a bit longer and requires a bit more experience. So AVPU is absolutely adequate for your foundation years. Next, you want to look at the pupils and you want to know whether they are equal and whether they're reacting to light. Changes may be asymmetrical and this is relevant, so make sure to note if there is a difference in diameter before or after exposing the eye to light. When we're assessing D, we always remember to look for blood glucose. The saying is that D, E, F, G at the end of A, B, C, D is for don't ever forget glucose. It's very easy to do, but it's absolutely critical. Less than four is a problem that needs correcting immediately. And while you're assessing somebody's neurology, you can have a look for any signs of obvious weakness. You wouldn't perform a full neurological examination of any part of the body during an A, B, C, D, E assessment, but you would be able to notice if somebody had an obvious asymmetry to their face or if there was a limb that they'd stopped using. Warning signs in disability would be any reduced conscious level less than A in the AVPU scale. Somebody who is agitated, which would usually indicate that their circulation to their brain is adequate. Somebody with changes to their pupils, either symmetrically or asymmetrically, or somebody with a blood glucose of less than four millimoles per litre. If you're happy with disability, then you'd move on to exposure. And at this point, we're looking for other auxiliary pieces of information that might point us in the direction of the underlying pathology. So you'd start with a temperature, which could be core or peripheral, and you can compare the two. Core temperature being the most important by far in cases of hypothermia or of infection. More than 39 would be particularly severe for a fever, but it's certainly relevant if a patient's temperature exceeds 37.8. You would look for rashes in the skin, and you might notice these centrally or peripherally, and you'd look for mottling. That is, evidence that the skin is not being adequately perfused and is becoming pale. You'd look for any signs of bleeding from any open wound or from any other lesions, which might explain hypovolemia in the context of shock. And you'd look for bruising consistent with coagulation abnormalities that may be seen in sepsis or in trauma. A worrying sign is somebody with a temperature that is particularly high or particularly low, or anybody with mottling of their skin. If at any point during your A, B, C, D, E assessment you found something that's particularly worrying or that isn't responding to your intervention, the key thing is to get help immediately. You continue to assess and intervene where you can, reassessing after each time you've done something different and wait for help to arrive. If the patient loses their output, then of course you activate the usual 2222 call for assistance. The single most important thing to remember when treating patients who are critically ill is that it's a team job and you should not be doing it on your own, especially not as a junior doctor. So call for help early if you're worried about somebody and if at any point your assessments aren't changing the picture in front of you and your interventions don't seem to be doing anything, then a critical care review may be appropriate. Critical care involves taking patients to parts of the hospital that have the facility to apply more invasive and more intensive monitoring, both in terms of equipment and devices, but also the staffing ratio. Different levels of critical care are able to offer different degrees and types of organ support, and it will be up to the receiving doctor in the critical care environment to decide precisely where the patient is placed. But it will be your job as a junior doctor anywhere in the hospital to identify patients for whom ward level care is no longer appropriate. The details of critical care environments and what they can offer will be covered in a future session. So I hope that's useful. It's a really rapid overview of A, B, C, D, E, pulling out the key priorities to remember at the bed space of somebody who's critically unwell.
Call for help early and don't be afraid to ask for assistance in anyone who you're not sure about.